All right, Tuesday means it's a rest thing. What does that mean? Extra YouTube content. We're getting everything you missed from Tensor's Demon Lord Banquet. Wild Perk has cut content from any news himself. Let's see what he has to say. While Perkis was probably one of the most well adapted parts of Tensida as a whole. Okay. But in the parts. Oh, that's a Shion destroying claim, man. That was so good. In the parts that the anime did decide to skip on, there were quite a few interesting moments that I think a lot of you would want to know about. Things like the Battle of Minds before Walpurgis had even started, or okay. just some more information behind the functionality of certain unique and ultimate skills. Regardless of what that content may be, though. I think the best way to end off this season of Tensida is by providing the most complete story I can for its climactic finale. Let's go! So, let's take a look at everything we missed from this Demon Lord Banquet of Walpurgis. <laughs> Ramrus doesn't even sit on the chair. She sits on the top of the chair, that's actually so funny. Do I feel an ad break incoming? Is he about to say, but first? Hmm, what's he gonna say? Maybe there's no ad. Take a look at everything we missed from this Demon Lord Banquet of Walpurgis. Before we get started, Starting with Rimmer's no initial ad. analysis of all the guests, there was a bit more to each of them than what we were shown in the anime. Key details that went to highlight certain aspects of their strength, personality, or characteristics. For starters, Gi was manipulating his aura in a way that was intended to deceive those around him. Okay. What Analyze and Assess had- So he's sandbagging. He's smurfing. He's not showing his true powers. First picked up was an aura of someone who was magically strong, but not entirely in control. Something about his magical doesn't match up. He's disguising himself as a novice who can't control his aura. Hmm. Kind of like a powerful yet inexperienced kid. Luckily for Rimuru, though, the analytical skills of Raphael made him realize that this was nothing more than a ruse. A clever manipulation of his aura that not only hid his true self, but also delivered false information to the people around him. Likely in hopes of getting them to underestimate him. Hmm. So, despite Walpurgis just getting started, it was clear from Gi's actions alone that the battle was already underway. Sure, it may just be a battle of information right now, but hiding one's skills was a significant part in keeping the advantage. Right, you don't want to let other people know what your ultimate skills are. It's like a game of poker. You don't. You want to keep a cool face, you don't want to show how strong you are, right? Only the idiots would come into this table flexing their power and being loud. Like Clayman, and no one takes him seriously. He's honestly become a fucking unit of measurement in terms of power scaling to this point, right? All the really strong people, they don't need to flex. In fact, they need to hide their power so that, you know, we can get more of an advantage. So long as the others weren't fully aware of what he was capable of, Rimuru could bluff or feign ineptness in order to get into his opponent's head. Which was exactly what Gi was doing already. To expand on this a little bit more, what Gi was doing was essentially testing everyone. He was using his own manipulated aura to determine who was worthy and who wasn't. Okay. If someone only possessed the most basic form of analyze and assess, then they wouldn't be able to see past Gi's clever tactic, and that was enough to indicate that they wouldn't be worth dealing with in the first place. Now, if someone did actually have the ability to- Dude, this cover picture, I've seen it before, it just- Dude, Gi Crimson looks so sick here, and Ramorous too. Bro, her art is- menacing, but in the anime she's just a cute little fairy. To read him properly, then whatever glimpse they would have into the true depths of Gi's power would be more than enough to intimidate them into submission. It was a win-win situation in which Gi was in complete control over. That's why Rimuru was able to quickly understand that he was on a completely different level from him. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the holy giant de Gruul, there was such a high concentration of magical- Hey, we're the stepdad now, right? Because, <laughs> like, he sent his fucking kids to us and now we're babysitting. ...energy emanating from his body that Rimuru couldn't say with certainty whether Veldora had more or not. It was as if he was looking into an infinite pool of it. Right, they did- Veldora was, like you mentioned, of all, like, the three people, I think it was Dino, Dagrol, and Luminous that he really mentioned as, like, people that were, like, uh, uh, that- that earned his respect. Dagro, I, I, yeah, Gi Crimson, of course, Rammer is for sure, for sure, but those specific people were mentioned during that one time when Veldra was talking to Rimuru before they went to Alpergus, and like, why does he have an infinite pool of it? All I know is that he's the fucking protector of the gates to heaven. There's some sort of holy element, some sort of, I don't know, angelic magicules he has, who knows. Regardless of whether it was infinite or not, though. What mattered most when it came to power was how that magicule energy was used. So, even if Degrul did possess a bunch of magicules, that alone wasn't enough to intimidate him like how Gi did. 
There isn't much to say about Valentine and his attendance, but the way his maid was manipulating her aura similarly to how Gi did was mm. something that Rimuru knew no other demon lord would be able to pick up on unless they themselves possessed an ultimate. And he never knew that she was luminous, like demon lord god luminous, until season 3 at the very end of Hinata vs. Rimuru, right? Like, he was shocked. Everyone didn't, like, even Raphael was like, bro, are you fucking serious? Like, he was the only one out of the secret. Ultimate skill. Then, with regards to Dino's conversation with Ramirez, we were given a bit more insight into her resurrection-based life cycle. Remember, her exposure to the immense auras of both dragon and demon had turned her into mm. the continuously resurrecting fairy that she is now. So, since her latest resurrection was only 500 years ago, only 500. both her spirit and body had degenerated to the current state that we see in the anime. It would take at least another several centuries before she would mature into what she was before. Is she gonna make it in time for Tema War? I wonder. There's gotta be a way to accelerate. We don't have to actually wait that. I'm gonna believe that there's some sort of skill or some sort of time manipulation we can do so that, like, Ramaris is in prime form if, we, if she ever participates in the Tema War. In any case, that was the trio who made up the second generation of Demon Lords, a group who we know have been around for at least 1500 years or longer. As for the ones to come after. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. I love Sky Queen. Carry on is a bro, but like these three are a fucking joke, man. I'm sorry. You know it. I know it. These are the weakest demon lords and this fucking table, right? Everyone cares about Gee Crimson, Ramirez, Milam, you know, Luminous here, Dagrodino. We don't know about Dagrodino, but they're fucking hype, right? This is a problem. It's a fucking problem because, like, obviously, power scaling exists and not everyone can be that strong and there needs to be levels, but, you know, these, this tree of fucking demon lords that after is just kind of an embarrassment compared to the previous generation. Well, their level of power certainly didn't compare to any of the others. In fact, Rimuru was pretty confident that both Xion and Benimaru now possessed more magicules than even Frey did. Damn. You could even consider them to be at the same level as Valentine right now. But. And then. Laplace exceeds that because he beat Valentine, right? Plus Valentine right now. Wait, uh, what was that day? Fuck, there's so many shows where if there's like a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse or some shit happening, people like lose powers. Was this the day that the holy people had least amount of power? And that's why Laplace went during that day, right? Was it a full moon? I forget what the weather uh requirement was but that was a special day right when the holy powers of the church full moon is okay anti for got it got it got it but as i said before that quantity didn't really matter if you didn't know how to use it so it's very possible that freak that is so aggressive this is what i would actually call chesticles could possess a bunch of hidden skills which would make her far more powerful than what analyze and assess would indicate now prior excuse me Excuse me, what did you just say about Frey? Very possible that Frey could possess a bunch of hidden skills, which would make her far more powerful than what Analyze and Assess would indicate. Okay. Well, Karyon and Clayman, Clayman's not even here anymore. They're kind of lost. They're saying that, hey, you know, Frey hiding some shit. You know, you might think she's weak right now compared to the other generations, but like, listen, she got some cards hidden up her sleeve. So we'll see about that. Prior to Clayman's arrival, there was a cutscene involving the relay of information from Benimaru to Rimuru. By using what's now known as a soul circuit, Rimuru's conscious was able to communicate with any monsters under his command. It wasn't as complex as the soul corridor he had with Veldora, but it was enough to be able to talk through. Cool. So, the gist of what Benimaru was telling Rimuru was pretty much the outcome of the battle. It was a completely one-sided victory in which Benimaru had displayed absolute dominance over. In a battle that lasted only an hour, not only were Clayman's forces wiped out with 1,000 killed and 3,000 wounded, but not a single person had been killed from Rimuru's side either. Of course, there Gata. was a bit more regarding how exactly Benimaru used Born Leader to beat Kuribidis, but that's not really a topic relevant to El Perkis. Uh, Born Leader is like the gift that he got during Demon Lord Rimuru's ascension, and then it kind of just like lets him just become just like a strategy god, right? Yeah, that whole war was a fucking joke. It was, we were honestly fucking around with Midray and them, right? We were. We were practically just fucking sparring at a certain point, just ignoring like the actual war, just like having fun. What is, is the fact that this was how Rimuru had gained a general idea of Clayman's story. 
Before we get to the beginning of that whole dispute though, there was an interesting realization that Rimuru had come to after using Analyze and Assess on the rest of the Demon Lords. When he had attempted to gauge the strength of Leon, he found that Leon simply wasn't analyzable at all. What? A phenomenon that went to indicate that he too possessed an ultimate skill. Remember, ultimate skill can counter another ultimate skill. So, some sort of ultimate skill that has these sub-skill passives where analyze is cancelable, okay? The instant Rimuru understood that this was what that phenomenon meant, that's when he'd also come to realize that Gi was doing more than simply testing everyone. Yes, he was screening the room for powerful individuals, but he was also feeding fake information to fend off everybody else's ultimate skills. Rather than give away the fact that he too had an ultimate skill by making himself completely unreadable, he instead decided to display a fake reading. Mm. That way, even if the other person did in fact- True, because what Leon is doing is you can directly see that he's kind of like nullifying your read and assess, which kind of, you know, hints at his potential at ultimate skill. But what he is doing is something a little bit more different. You're kind of just like have a different veil of disguise. It's a different mask. Now, obviously, people are going to figure that out. And maybe people are going to think like, oh, he's like, you know, an ultimate skill maybe you know, be responsible for this too, but you know, I think what he's doing is smarter, just having a poker face. To possess an ultimate skill, they wouldn't know for sure whether Gi really had one since he wasn't doing anything to counter it. Exactly. Unless that person possessed an ultimate skill as intuitive as Raphael, then there was no way they'd be able to see that Gi was using this fake aura to hide his own ultimate skill. It was an ingenious tactic that Rimuru now recognized Luminous was using for that same purpose as well. Nick. Yes, now I realize, that's in like season 3 at the end of the war against Hinata. No, not a war, the battle. Making her the fourth person on Rimuru's list of demon lords with ultimate skills. Now, since these were everyone's ace in the hole, it made sense that they would want to hide it. But the fact that Rimuru had toned down his aura to give away zero information was really all the information that anybody with an ultimate skill would need. Just the action of blocking anybody else's analysis was more than enough to indicate that he was using an ultimate skill to do so. Got it. They may not be able to tell what type of ultimate skill it is he had, but there was no doubt that Gi was now aware of Rimuru's possession of one. What did Gi do when he moved the room? Remember some kind of spatial thing he did? Like the tables and everything expanded? Now that's probably- I, I, I'm wondering because like he used that skill, but obviously he was comfortable showing that. I'm like trying to think about what Gi's power is, but... He had some sort of, like, space manipulation that time. Considering that Rimuru had four, though, it really wasn't that big of a deal if he decided to show off one of them. There were actually numerous ways in which this could work to his favor. Really, it just depended on how Rimuru wanted- Probably the coolest that Rimuru has ever looked, bro. This- this scene here, man. ...to approach it. Moving on to the beginning of Wellpurgis now, there wasn't much difference between the anime and the novels until the actual fighting began. So, if we skip ahead to the moment when Milam first launched her attack, we see that even with Thought Acceleration slowing down one Almost second dead. to the equivalent of 277 hours, Rimuru still wasn't able to fully dodge her. Now, with the new busted-ass skill that Rimuru gained while fighting Hinata, right, he, he pretty much has like kind of like future sight. I wonder if this dodge would be a lot more easier. Had he diverted his attention to think about a counter even once, then there was no doubt that he would have left himself open. A fatal mistake that he knew he couldn't afford to make right now. Yes, infinite regeneration could probably save him one or two times, but the amount of magicals required for that was way more than he was willing to spend. That's why he decided to mainly focus on dodging. Now, while all that was going on, there were a few- Real life size Milam. No, I think this is just like an imagery thing to show how strong and dominant she looks when she's attacking. A few interesting details left out from the scene with Beretta and Gi. You see, the fact that Gi had granted Beretta permission to call him by his name was actually indication that Beretta- That's crazy. Well, even like, calling him Rouge is already such a sign of respect. Because only primordials can call each primordials kind of like that. And that's why Demon Hunter D was so surprised when Diablo was referring to other people, right? I think she, he, he referred to the uh, girl as Blanc and, and he's like, what the fuck? But- Damn, Beretta gets the special privilege to call him Guy Beyond Rouge. Beretta was strong enough to live up to his standards. It was a rare privilege that wasn't given out to just anyone. But even if Guy did recognize Beretta's power as acceptable, he was still ready to destroy her body right there had she fumbled with the question he was going to ask her next. Ooh. If Beretta tried to avoid committing to serving only Ramorous, then Guy wouldn't have hesitated to kill her immediately. 
which was actually the outcome that he was expecting. When Beretta had gone to indicate otherwise, though, Guy was surprised to see that she didn't conform to the more standard nature of a demon. I mean, most, if not all, demons want to be recognized by their master. So for yeah, they do. To that Diablo that does. Actually, the case. Well, that just made her seem quite unusual in the eyes of Guy. The Beretta not simping basically gained Guy's respect, leading him to ask the question about her lineage. Switching back to the fight now, Rimuru had actually gone ahead and run and analyze and assess on the Nine Heads White Monkey and Moon Rabbit. What he found was that both were intelligent enough to support the other in battle with their own special abilities. The Moon Rabbit would use some form of control. I'm surprised we haven't seen uh, Clayman's pet that we took in. Remember this guy? He was basically just being tortured the entire time and was manipulated to attack. But I thought that him and Ranga would become friends or some shit. I don't think I've ever seen this dude afterwards. Abilities. The Moon Rabbit would use some form of control gravity to weigh down its opponents, then the White Monkey would jump in to weaken their defenses. It was a combination of attacks that would eventually allow the Nine Head to jump in and finish their targets off. Fortunately for Ranga, though, seeing through that basic attack pattern was far too easy for him. Ranga did. Him and his other commander level Star Wolves were more than capable of breaking down their opponent's teamwork. It did give him the upper hand in combat, but landing a finishing blow on any of the three magical beasts was proving to be quite difficult. If we fast forward to Baldora's sudden appearance now. There was one other reason for his arrival beyond that of wanting to finish his manga. What is it? As it turns out, Diablo had apparently returned from his subjugation mission in Varmus. Okay. So, with him being back to protect Tempest, Veldora was now free to leave and meet up with Rimuru. We don't get any additional details other than that, but I think Varmus's brief transition to power is definitely worth mentioning. Oh, this is a... I know that this is obviously created two years ago before this scene, which is animated this year, but remember, this is the uh, carrot scene of all the fucking the Baldi, the King, and the other dudes, Ramen as well. Especially since Rimuru thought it would take anywhere from a few months to a year to finish. Now, during Xion's fight with Clayman, the reason she was able to resist his ultimate form of demon domination was mainly due to her skill Complete Memory. Okay. This was the power to record her memories directly into her astral body, making her a type of Astral body. Fuck. Ah, oh, shit. The cell is the power. The mitochondria is the power of the cell. During that Anya's video, the astral body is like this, like envelope of a layer around, like the core soul, right? Yeah, I remember like the different layers. That's a long time ago. Of demi spiritual life form who could think via her soul. Okay. So even if her brain and body were completely destroyed, her now conscious soul with all her existing memories could simply be placed into a new physical body thus letting her cheat death whenever she wanted. That's busted. Not really the same idea of how Bilzebub was quote-unquote sacrificed but saved a backup copy and then copied over. This is, again, just saving a backup of her soul into a separate entity and then just like implanting that into a vessel afterwards. Not only that, but it also made it so that any type of attack on her spirit or mind would be completely neutralized. OP. So she was pretty much immune to everything that Clayman specialized in. Shion is actually so fucking busted the more I think about it. Like, she honestly is. It's just that because of her comedic, you know, gags and, you know, big booba airhead secretary moments, I don't really realize. But like, when you really think about the skill she has, it's kind of insane what she does. When it came to Clayman's second phase, Xion had made good- Damn! Okay, ignore the Xion here. The Clayman art here, I think this is the manga probably. This is looking pretty hard. The use of her unique skill Master Chef to guarantee her victory. Her intrinsic skill Ogre Berserker did give her the force she needed, but it was the subskill's certain outcome and optimal action that made Clayman's weapons and defenses completely useless against her. While optimal action allowed her to read his flow of energy, Certain outcome overwrote the very nature of the weapons he was holding, mm -hmm. making them extremely easy to smash once they'd crossed paths with her Soul Eater sword. So, with the second phase pretty much over now, Milam's reveal came with a bit more insight into the steps that she had taken to fool Clayman. You see, to make herself seem influenced by the demon dominate magic was actually a lot harder than it was to outright negate it. And that's because magic like that would normally just bounce off of her. 
Yeah, so she had to like put on the greatest act ever to make it look like the necklace actually worked. Not only that, but even if she did remove all her defensive barriers, she would still have to hold back all her natural force just so she wouldn't passively resist it instead. Jesus. Only by holding back her own power and deactivating all her defenses was she finally able to make it seem like the demon dominate magic was working. That's actually so funny. The steps and the things that we had to do to finally make Clayman's, you know, the dominate magic work. Like, we just had to turn off everything. It's just like, turn off every skill, every fucking passive, all the defense, and finally we can act like it's working. Well, that plus all the bell peppers she'd been eating to help her maintain a straight face. <laughs> what? Really? <laughs> she ate bell peppers? <laughs> <laughs> to have that coup de day face? What do you mean? Why bell pepper? She hates it? I don't know. Now, the third and final face of this Clayman boss fight was pretty much exactly as we saw. But there was, however, a more detailed description behind how Rimuru was utilizing his thought acceleration here. Right. I think I asked that question where shouldn't Clayman be experiencing pain on the same level of like, you know how Hakuro versus that human guy? And his thing was also an accelerating mind, but Hakuro killed him so fast and made him just like witness that pain and death for so fucking long. So like, everything that, you know, Clayman was like feeling, it should have felt like eternity of suffering. And since I did mess up my explanation of it last video, I figured this would be a good scene to properly explain it with. Okay. So, for thought acceleration to increase his perception speed by a factor of a million. One second would now feel more like 277 hours for him. Jesus. It was 11 and a half days in which time would appear as if it was frozen. That said, this state of enhanced perception wasn't only used for Rimuru to take in his surroundings. He could also use it yeah, to- Yeah, this guy is the exact example of what Hakuro did. ...negate the cast times of any spells that he wanted. Even if he was casting the most intricate spell ever conceived, the full day it would normally take to complete its setup would only take one tenth of a second for Rimuru. Any spell he wanted could be cast multiple times and still seem as if it was released simultaneously. OP. Another aspect of thought acceleration that wasn't really fully explained was exactly what it meant for Rimuru to extend this skill's ability over to Clayman. You see, by making Clayman perceive things one million times faster as well- He can well, suffer that much too! Wait, what the fuck was that scene? Is that Clayman's crotch? She only, I, that must have happened so fast that I didn't even catch it during the actual fucking episode. As well, the few seconds of punches he received in battle were actually more like a several dozen days of agony and torture. For what felt like over a month, all Clayman could know and feel was absolute pain and terror. It was a gruesome experience that had it. even made his hair start to fall out. Wait, he started to bald? Yo, it would have been fucking hilarious if we saw a bald Clayman at the end. By the time it was over. All that was left was the horrified husk of what Clayman used to be. But yeah, that's pretty much it for everything that's we missed it? from Wild Perkis. All right. All the stuff to come after was essentially taken word for word from the novels. So there wasn't really much we missed other than a few interesting tactics and a couple extra details about some skills here and there. All in all, it was definitely one of the better adapted portions Octogram. of the game. But anyway, that's gonna wrap things up for my videos on- Y'all know what to do. Go give him a like! Sub to his channel if you haven't. Check out his channel. That was a pretty good breakdown of what happened in Wild Purgus. And we're just farming slime content because it's a little bit of a break time right now. And I think that this coming week, it is an actual Tensura break day. So maybe we can try to figure out other Tensura content to cover on Friday. I'm not really sure. No promises, but see you on the next one.